Good morning, everyone. This is Shiloh. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Affirming Ministries Coordinator of Edmonton, based on the Robertson Wesley United Church. Um, today, I have a, uh, a lot of information. Um, today's live stream is going to be about queer leaders. Um, I kind of focused it a little bit on Canada. Uh, so obviously, this is not everyone that has made big changes in Canada uh, within you know, human rights or laws. Uh, but these are a few key folks that I'd like to bring to light today. So the first person that I'd like to chat about um, is Jim Egan. So Jim Egan was born in 1921 uh, in Toronto and unfortunately died in March 9th of 2000. Here I have a, a photo of him as well here. So he's the one with a fancy mustache on the right. So he was a Canadian LGBT rights activist, best known for his role in the landmark Supreme Court of Canada, uh, Case Egan versus Canada. Uh, Egan realized he was gay at a very young age and met his lifelong partner, John Nesbitt, who's on the left there, uh, in 1948. Professionally, Egan was self-employed as the owner of a biological specimen business and so felt able to speak out without risk of losing his job, um, which was a huge fear that many other LGBTQ people had back then. Beginning in 1949, Egan wrote hundreds of letters and articles, opinions, and editorial pieces to both magazines and newspapers advocating equal rights for and criticizing inaccurate portrayals of both lesbian and gay people. Uh, he also, in 1964, uh, was featured on the Sydney Cats quoted, The Homosexual Next Door, um, which was a McLean's article, which was one of the most positive portrayals of homosexuality um, ever to appear in mainstream Canadian publications um, up until that time. Having reached retirement age, uh, Egan actually began trying to collect his uh, Canadian pension plan benefits in 1986. Um, this is where he tried to apply for spousal benefits for his partner, uh, Nesbitt, uh, the following year. Unfortunately, uh, when they applied for it, um, they decided to apply for it just because it would, they'd make a really strong case um, for the legal rights of same-sex couples being able to gain um, pension plan benefits. And so they applied for it, and unfortunately their benefits were denied, um, and they took the case to court, um, and they lost again in the federal court in 91, um, as well as the F federal court of appeal in 93, um, and then until the, the court reached the Supreme Court in 94. Um, in 95, the Supreme Court ruled, um, and ruled against Egan, actually, on the issue of spousal benefits. Um, they said that finding that the restriction of such benefits to heterosexual couples was just a, as a was a justified infringement um, because the core purpose of benefits at the time was to provide financial support to women um, who would spend their lives raising children rather than being employed. Um, so unfortunately, it did not pass. But uh, because of their um, coarse claim, it was seen as a significant victory to LGBTQ rights. Um, just because sexual orientation then was uh, prohibited grounds of discrimination underneath the Canadian Charters of Rights and Freedoms. Um, so I had a lot of later successes in courts, but unfortunately uh, for Egan, the beneficiaries um, did not pass. The next gentleman I'd like to chat about um, is not Egan, but this gentleman, George Clilbert. George was born in 1926. Uh, and died in 1996. He was known as the last person in Canada to be arrested for, or to be arrested, charged, persecuted, convicted, and imprisoned for gross indecency. So this was before uh, the decriminalization of homosexual acts in 1996, or 1969, sorry, um, which was reformed because of uh, Kilbert's case. So Kilbert was originally from Saskatchewan. Uh, he was raised in Calgary, Alberta, um, so close to home here. And in 1960, he was convicted on 18 charges of gross indecency and sentenced to four years of imprisonment. Upon his release, he then moved to northern Canada and the Northwest Territories to work. 
Um, and then in 65, he was picked up by the police uh, for questioning and related to an arson uh, that happened nearby. Uh, thankfully, he was uh, found not guilty for that or having any involvement with the fire. But in the uh, case of being apprehended, Kilbert voluntarily admitted that he was having um, consen consensual homosexual relations with four different adult men. And because of this, he was uh, subsequently arrested and charged again um, with four counts of gross indecency. So a court ordered psychiatrists assess Kilbert as incurably homosexual. I don't really know what that's supposed to mean, but I guess at that time it meant that it was a bad thing. Um, and so, yeah, he was considered incurably homosexual, and he was uh, sentenced to preventive detention, um, which means indefinitely, as a dangerous sexual offender, just because he had consensual sex with an adult man. Um, he was now a dangerous sex offender, um, according to the law. And Kilbert appealed the Court of Appeal for the Northwest Territories, um, and then it was dismissed, so he brought it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, and again, his appeal was dismissed um, in 67, um, and the decision was 3-2. to two. The day after Kilbert's conviction was upheld, um, the new Democrat Party, uh, Tommy Douglas, who is amazing, uh, invoked a Kilbert's name in the House of Commons of Canada, stating that homosexuality is a social and psychiatric problem rather than a criminal one, which, I mean, I also would disagree with the psychiatric problem side of it, but definitely not a criminal one. And he asked the Prime Minister, Lester Person, if he would consider setting up a commission to study the issues. Um, he, Douglas later followed up with the Minister of Justice at the time, which was Pierre Trudeau, um, and asked if there was any consideration um, to remove this or to change it, and within six weeks, Pierre Trudeau presented the Criminal Law Amendment Act, um, which was happening between 68 and 69, um, which was a bill that was then passed that would decriminalize the homosexual acts between consenting adults. So this law thankfully passed uh, in 1969. Um, unfortunately, Kilbert still remained in prison until 1971. Um, and then he was released and had a few years left until he uh, did pass later on. So that's a little bit about uh, George Kilbert. The next gentleman I want to talk about is Rupert Raj. So Rupert Raj here was born in 1952. Uh, he was born in on Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, Raj was a Canadian of Indian and Polish descent, and he was a a well-known trans activist and considered himself as a transgender man. Um, he's worked a lot since his own transgender, uh, tra his own gender transition in 71. Um, and he's been recognized a few times with several different awards, um, such as his inclusion in the uh, Natural Portrait Collection of the Art Kives, or Art Quives. <laughs> it's archives with a Q, so it's a little queer innuendo there, which is the Canada's LGBTQ2 plus archives. Um, well, at the age of 19, he scheduled his own appointment with an endocrinologist and was admitted his uh, first shot of testosterone. He then later graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology um, and was involved in many different associations. One of the first ones was the Association of Canadian Transsexuals, or it was called ACT, A-C-T, um, and this was based in Toronto. Raj also continued his activism by starting a petition to get Ontario to cover say, uh, sex reassignment surgeries or gender confirmation surgeries, uh, which is what they're called now, um, through the Provincial Health Insurance Plan. Um, and unfortunately, that was very unsuc unsuccessful at the time. Um, and later on in 78, uh, he decided to start an organization for trans people, um, including trans men and women, as well as cross-dressers. This was uh, called the Foundation of the Advancement of Canadian Transsexuals, or FACT, F-A-C-T. And the organization's letter... Um, the organization's newsletter was a gender review uh, called A Factual Journal, and in 81, Raj decided to focus on the unique specific needs of trans men, um, which at the time there was a very few uh, 
uh, advocacy groups just for trans men in particular, um, just because uh, one there wasn't a many there wasn't many trans men, um, and as well as just with uh, male privilege within the trans masculine community, um, a lot of them were able to pass and live stealth, and so there was not really a need um, for it. But he decided to do one, and I'm glad he did because there is definitely some needs. Um, that the trans masculine community also needs as well. Um, one of the next people is actually uh, very close to home. So many of you probably already know her um, or are aware of her presence. So this is Marnie Panis. So uh, Marnie was born in Camrose, Alberta, and she currently resides here in Edmonton. Um, she is a Canadian LGBTQ activist and identifies as a transgender woman. Uh, and she's campaigned all over Canada for LGBTQ causes. Um, she's, uh, right now, is the diversity and inclusion professional. And she's dedicated to creating safe and welcoming and inclusive environments, especially for the LGBTQ2S plus population at large. Um, and she does this through educating through um, public and private organizations, different types of levels of government and departments, uh, as well as healthcare, educational institutions, corrections, and law enforcement. Uh, most recently, she was a member of the LGBTQ Apology Advisory Council, which helped draft the apology that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered in the House of Commons um, on November 28, uh, 2017. So that was just about almost three years ago. Um, which was an apology towards the LGBTQ2S plus people in Canada uh, for um, the discrimination and injustices faced by, faced by this community as a result of federal legislation, policies, and programs that were in place. She was also uh, part of the work that led to the gender identity and gender expression um, being added to the protected grounds of discrimination. Um, also in the Alberta Human Rights Act, she was part of the uh, expert panel that assisted in developing some of the guidelines um, to support school boards um, and in Alberta to create policies that created a lot of safe and welcoming environments for students, families, staff, and everyone involved. And lastly, she recently provided a testimony to the Standing Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Um, here she was doing this for support of Bill C-16, which many of you probably are familiar with as this was really recent, um, which is, uh, Bill C-16 is the act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code of Canada, um, to include gender, uh, expression and gender identity. Uh, and this happened in, uh, 2017. So she's very common around, uh, the city, um, She's a great ad advocate. I've met her many times, and she's just very lovely. So I hope at, at some point you all get a chance to, to say hi and meet with her. One of the next groups of people, and I'm going to say groups because there's two, uh, there's two folks here that many of you probably know if you listen to the radio. Um, these two are probably one of my favorite bands. Um, they're called Tegan and Sarah. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with them. Uh, they're all over the radio. They're very popular in uh, the pop genre. Uh, they were both born in 1980 uh, in Calgary, Alberta, again, also close to home. Uh, Tegan and Sarah Quinn are identical twin sisters who formed a Canadian indie pop band back in 1998. Um, both of them are musicians, uh, songwriters, and uh, can use multi uh, a multitude of different types of instruments. Um, they both live in Vancouver, BC, and are openly out as gay. Uh, Tegan and Sarah are actively politically and socially engaged. Uh, they are both advocates for LGBTQ equality, as well as music education, uh, literacy, and cancer research. In 2012, they appeared on the cover of Under the Radar magazine's protest issue. Um, they were both photographed holding a sign that read, quote, The rights of the minority should never be subject to the whim of the majority, end quote. Also in Canada, they were actively supporting the Quebec students in their protest against the, the provincial government. In November 10th, uh, 2016, rather than boycotting North Carolina for their uh, um, HB2 bill, which is the House Bill 2, 
Um, if many of you remember from back in 2016, this was the bathroom bills that North Carolina was doing, um, where they were trying to get folks to uh, only enter bathrooms that had their uh, sex assigned as, as birth. So for me, example, I was assigned female at birth, so if I were in North Carolina, the bill would have forced me um, to only enter in female washrooms because of my um, birth certificate. Um, so that was a huge craze back in, uh, nine, or in uh, 2016, and so Tegan and Sarah actually, uh, instead of boycotting uh, their concert in North Carolina, they decided to perform anyway at the Orange Peel and decided to donate all of their proceeds from that show to the Equality North Carolina, um, which was an organization there that was able to fight the legislation and not let it pass. They were also awarded the Outstanding Music Award at the GLAAD Media Awards, uh, which is awesome because uh, they were beating out high-profile uh, musicians such as Lady Gaga and Elton John, um, which I think is just amazing. They're both amazing people. In uh, 2014, uh, Tegan and Sarah joined the World Pride to perform uh, in the closing ceremonies in downtown Toronto, as well as in 2016, uh, in the wake of the United States' uh, presidential election with Trump, they actually founded the Tegan and Sarah Foundation. Um, and this foundation uh, helps to fight for the economic justice, the health, and representation for LGBTQ girls and women. Um, and so they've just been doing a lot of great stuff over the past few years. Um, as a relatively smaller indie band, um, they are quite popular. Um, unfortunately, they're not as popular as some would like, especially for me. I love Tegan and Sarah. I love all of their songs. Um, I wish they had a lot more uh, representation and uh, were able to get out there. But I think based off of the uh, fame and fortune that they do have, they've been putting a lot of it to good use um, to help support uh, LGBTQ folks, especially women and girls. Um, especially with Tegan and Sarah both be <laughs> being lesbians, um, I know one of, if you haven't listened to Tegan and Sarah, this is my notion to you is just please take time out of your day to day, go on one of their albums and just take a listen. Their music is fantastic. Um, if you don't know what song to listen to, listen to the song Boyfriend. Um, the reason why I like the song is that it brings me back to when I was uh, out as a lesbian. Um, there's a lot of culture within the queer community, and so if you're in different parts of the queer community, there's almost like a whole culture around it. So when I identified as a lesbian, I was part of the lesbian culture, and now I'm part of the trans masculine culture. Um, but within the lesbian culture, there's always this, um, I guess, theme that goes around uh, where gay women, unfortunately, always seem to fall for a straight woman. Um, and so the song Boyfriend is essentially considered the I Fell For A Straight Girl anthem, and it just, it speaks to me on a spiritual level. Um, as a past lesbian, if you identify as lesbian and you're listening to them, I'm sure you're gonna really, uh, understand a lot of what they're trying to say, and, and some of their music just speaks to me, um, and maybe to you in ways that other songs just couldn't back in, in that time. So, definitely take a look at Tina and Sarah, they're amazing and great. Um... And if you don't like their music, maybe try taking a look at Vivek uh, Sharia's um, music. So, uh, Sh uh, Sharia was born in uh, 81, uh, and she was actually born in Edmonton, Alberta, um, which is a lot more closer to home. Uh, she was born uh, as a Canadian, and she's considered a Canadian musician, a writer, and visual artist. Um, she's currently living in Calgary. Um, where she's the assistant professor in the creative writing program at the University of Calgary. Um, uh, Soraya is also the director on the board of the Tegan and Sarah Foundation because uh, they are in close contact with each other, um, which I think is just fantastic. Uh, and the last time I saw Tegan and Sarah in concert, uh, Vivek actually opened for them, um, which is probably why uh, they, she's been part of their, their foundation. Um, Vivek has also released over a dozen solo albums in a range of different genres. She's also published many books, uh, such as one called God Loves Hair, which is illustrated collection of 21 linked short stories about brown, genderqueer child growing up in an immigrant family in Alberta. 
Um, and also a book called The Boy and the Bindi, um, which is one of my favorite books, which explores the difference and self-acceptance of gender expectations and gender identities um, within families. So definitely take a uh, look at some of Vivek's stuff, some of her music, some of her um, books and um, visual art. She's just a fantastic artist all around and just a lovely person um, as well. The second last person I have for you today um, is Erin McLeod. Erin um, McLeod was, I guess still is, um, a huge influence in my life. Um, I looked up to Erin all my life, essentially. She was born in uh, 1983. Um, she was also born close to home. She was born actually up in uh, St. Albert, which is not too far from here. Um, she is a Canadian soccer player who plays as a goalkeeper for the NWSL club um, called Orlando Pride, um, and she's re represented Canada internationally. She's played for the Canadian women's um, FIFA uh, team, and she's been on the Canadian women's national soccer team since 2002. Um, she's made over 118 appearances for the team. Um, and then she, also, she, in 2012, was part of the Canadian Soccer Association Centennial Celebration and was honored on the all-time Canadian um, women's team. I really uh, looked up to her because, one, I played soccer as a young woman. Um, I was also a young gay woman, and McLeod is an openly uh, gay woman, and she came out publicly during a CBC interview following the controversy surrounding the 2014 Sochi Olympics and Russians' gay propaganda laws. Um, she was among a group of athletes who called for a change in the language of the Olympic Charter, um, where host city contracts must include non-discrimination um, of sexual orientation. Um, she also served as a Canadian athlete uh, commission as the LGBTQ rep representative. Um, so I guess for me, just as a, a young queer woman um, who was a goalkeeper in soccer, she was essentially the person I wanted to be when I grew up. She was essentially everything I, I was. She was a goalkeeper, soccer, gay, um, amazing, a great athlete, um, and was an awesome advocate for um, gay women in sports. So. She's awesome and amazing, and it lives really close. So this is a photo of her here. Yeah, amazing shots. The next person, uh, and the last person that I have to show for you guys today is Delvin Green. Um, unfortunately, Delvin... Um, also was really close to home for me. Um, as many of you know, I graduated from the King's University, um, which is why Delvin Vreen is so um, unfortunately famous. <laughs> so Delvin was born in 1966. Uh, he is a uh, Canadian who was at the center of a landmark provincial and federal legal case. Um, this was labeled the Vreen versus Alberta case. Um, which in, in concerned the inclusion of sexual orientation as a protected human right in Canada. Um, Vreen's parents were members of the local Christian Reformed Church, and he attended private Christian elementary schools and secondary schools, and eventually enrolled at the King's College, um, which is now considered uh, now known as the King's University here in Edmonton. He later tra uh, transferred to the Calvin College in Michigan, um, and he earned his physics and mathematical degree, um, and then returned back to the King's College um, to work as a laboratory coordinator and chemistry lab instructor. Uh, he worked at the King's College at the time for about three years, and in 1991, uh, Vreen was open with his congregation about being in a same-sex relationship, um, which unfortunately led to his firing because his sexual orientation was deemed incompatible with the newly created statement of religious belief that was adopted by the King's College. Vreen attempted to file a discrimination complaint with the Human um, Rights... It, it, with the discriminatory complaint with the Alberta Human Rights Commission, um, but he was refused on the grounds that sexual orientation was not protected under the Provincial's Human Rights Code. Um, so he actually sued the uh, Alberta government and its Human, <laughs> human Rights Commission. 
Um, so because of this, in 1994, uh, Alberta ruled that sexual orientation must be treated as a protected class under human rights legislation, and that the provincial government appealed, and in 1996, um, the decision was overruled by the Alberta Court of Appeal. Um, this is when the decision was then appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, and that's why it's known now as the Reen versus Alberta case, um, who finally in 1998 uh, said that the provincial governments could no longer exclude protections of individuals from human rights legislation based on the uh, based just solely on sexual orientation. Um, based on popular misunderstanding, uh, the Vreen case was actually not against the King's College um, at the time, now known as the University. Um, he did not sue King's at all. Uh, King's had nothing to do with it. The only thing that they did was fire Vreen. Um, and because of that firing, that's when he applied to the Alberta um, uh, Human Rights Commission, and then he sued Alberta, not the school. Um... Yeah, and so the Supreme Court decision in the Vreen versus Alberta case has now been used by provincial cases um, all over Canada and has helped uh, against any bans of same-sex marriage or uh, any bans of not having sexual orientation on any of the Human Rights Commissions um, all over the country. Uh, and that's all thanks to, to Delwyn Vreen for, for suing Alberta uh, because the university that I went to decided to fire him. Um, so Vreen's very close to home. Um, when I was at King's, I actually did the King's first uh, Pride Week, um, and it happened to be the exact 20-year anniversary um, of the of the Delwyn Vereen case. So um, that was a really historical moment, and I am lucky to say that the King's University has made a huge progression um, in where they were <laughs> um, back in uh, 91, and now to, to when I graduated in 19... Uh, 2019, um, they've made huge changes, um, and I'm really blessed to have been able to go to King's and have a better uh, experience than than Vreen did um, as a staff. So, yeah, so that's uh, all of the folks that I had today. Um, I'll just go through uh, again, just showing the photos, the names uh, of folks, just so that you guys can see it one more time. So here we have Jim Egan, who again uh, helped with the Egan versus Canada with the benefits um, for partners. We had George Clipper, who was the last person to be arrested in Canada um, for uh, homosexual acts that was decriminalized in '96 or '69. Um, we now also touched base on Rupert Raj, who was a one of the first uh, important transmasculine. Um, advocates who helped uh, organizations for transgender folks, such as ACT and FACT, um, and created safe spaces for trans masculine folks. There was also Marty Panis, who we talked about, who is an Edmonton-based um, advocate who's helped all over Canada with a lot of the federal uh, cases, as well as changes to human rights acts. She's also an educator for all of the levels of government, education, healthcare, and law enforcement here in Alberta. We also touched base a little bit on Tegan and Sarah, who's uh, really great uh, artists and musicians um, who I really love listening to, um, both from Calgary, Alberta, and has done so many things with their fame and wealth um, to shed uh, information and education around LGBTQ folks and helped um, provide foundations for LGBTQ women and girls. Um, and their partner in crime, uh, Vivek Shura. Uh, who's part of their foundation. Uh, she's also a musician, writer, and visual artist who was in born in Calgary, or born in Edmonton, now lives in Calgary, um, and she's a wonderful person um, to get to know. We also talked a little bit about Erin McLeod, um, who is one of the most important uh, female Canadian soccer players um, who is out as lesbian and helped uh, change ways for, for queer women in sports. And lastly, we touched base on Delvin Vreen, who made a huge impact on uh, gay people all over Canada, uh, making it uh, illegal to discriminate based on sexual orientation, um, which I think is just fantastic. So all of these people um, 
are very important to me and are huge leaders in Canada and in Alberta and in Edmonton um, and surrounding area. So all of these people deserve the recognition of the impact that they've had, not only for themselves and the people around them, but for generations to follow, um, including me, who um, have been able to live a great life of um, having you know my protections be be safe and to live in a safe place and not to worry about um, not having any um, supports legally or supports in healthcare um, and just being able to be myself. Uh, it's all thanks to all of these people and so I'm internally grateful for the work that they've done and I'm excited to see um, who else we can add to the list from now until the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I'd love to see how to kind of how far we come and how far we can go um, with making everything in the world equal and better for everyone. So thanks so much for uh, joining me today. Uh, if you have any questions or information or want any more um, info on any of these eight folks, uh, please uh, feel free to, to email me or send me a message and I would love to chat a little bit more. Um, hello, uh, Melissa. Welcome for joining in. Um, I'm glad that you were able to tune in. Um, but yeah, anyway, have a good rest of your Monday. I will see you all next Monday for the Affirming Reflections live stream at noon. Um, if you are interested, I do have a Affirming Coffee Hour that happens every Thursday at 11 a.m. Um, it goes from 11 till noon. It is a safe drop-in time through Zoom um, where you bring your own coffee and we just chat about life, LGBTQ topics, answer questions, hang out. Um, feel free to join us right at 11 or drop in at any time um, later on or come for a little bit and leave. Um, it's totally open and it's a safe place to come and ask questions and listen and be part of a, a small talk group and community. So I'd love to see you there. Just send me an email or a message on Facebook for the Zoom link for that. Um, and we'll see you then. So see you Thursday. If not, we'll see you next week on Friday. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good week.